David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Boo. Okay, all right. Yesterday was Halloween. Good morning. It is Wednesday, November 1st, 2023. Time marches on. Uh, oh, that's a good idea. All right, Justice is saying that we ought to be calling the day after Halloween Box Candy Day. That's a good idea. I like that. And uh, it'll help get rid of a lot of things. I have candy to spare. Um, I was convinced that we didn't have enough candy, you know, the, the usual, every year, basically, sort of thing. Oh, my God, so many kids are going to come. we got to have more candy. We can't run out. Then you'll have to give kids. What, what would you give kids when you ran out? I don't know. Back in the old days, you could give them uh, money for UNICEF, I guess. There was at least that, although I guess you could just give them the money to keep. But yeah, how much money do you give them? Anyway, we had plenty. And then uh, it's interesting. By the end of the night, the kids that everybody complains about, I didn't even put on a good costume. You're in high school. You shouldn't be. Those are those kids are enthusiastic and dedicated to Halloween. And uh, you should give them candy. You should give everybody candy. And they start getting fists full of candy at the end of the night. Although, I guess it works out because the first kids that come are the little tiny tots, right? You can barely make it up our stairs. And uh, if you give them like, you know, two or three pieces of the fun size, bite size candy, uh, that's enough to kill them, I think, basically. So you, you want to watch out for the sugar for those guys. And they're only going to do, you know, eight, ten houses anyway. The parents aren't going to let them have all of the candy at once. But the big kids are going to make themselves sick and gorge on it. Yeah, here you go. well, they can handle the sugar rush, I guess. Uh, but just trying to get rid of it at the end of the night, uh, I don't know why. Candy's great. You should keep it needed. And, of course, uh, uh, for the production staff here that does occasionally work outside the home, like all the time, uh, usually except for Mondays and Fridays, there's candy bowls at the office. That takes care of everything. But the extra bags of candy that I was convinced that we needed to buy, uh, unopened. Uh, receipt in the garbage. And we're going to be uh, enjoying uh, the old school candy for, I guess, weeks to come now. I also learned that uh, my candy is outdated. That's another thing. Uh, oh, his other note, by the way, saying time changes in about a week. Remember that we're about uh, we're a couple of days away now from uh, switching back to standard time, which is no longer standard because I think we spend more time on savings these days, daylight savings time, than we do on standard time, which would suggest that the standard is the other one. But you'll never get people to to switch that name. Uh, although there's a growing movement for getting rid of daylight savings time or one of the other of the times i don't remember which one they want to get rid of but uh people usually complain though about the daylight savings one because you spring forward and quote unquote lose an hour of sleep here you get an extra hour it doesn't really work out it doesn't feel like you're getting an extra hour or anything but okay uh so every time we remind ourselves that time is linear uh no it isn't twice a year it goes in the in the, well i guess once a year it goes in the wrong direction it's still linear even if you jump up ahead, right? You're still going in one direction. Although, I mean, linear. Hmm. Well, geometrists can explain that one. If we're jumping an hour back, we're headed in the wrong direction. It's a 180-degree turn, but it is along a single line, right? So, I don't know. Physicists, theoretical physicists uh, can, can chime in on that one as well. Uh, so, the candy that's left... We'll eat ourselves or hand out to uh, adults who come by. Uh, it was there's a lot of Halloween activity uh, yesterday. I thought it was going to rain earlier in the week, and that's why we had less candy. And then the forecast changed. We were very fortunate, and it stayed nice and warm as it has been for a couple of days during trick or treating hours, and then turned freezing cold afterward, which was fine. And uh, now we can preserve our candy outdoors instead of taking up freezer space. So I learned that my candy, though, is outdated. Kids, kids today, uh, like, uh, you know, the outdated candy of my youth, which was uh, Mary Janes and BB Bats and uh, <laughs> they, all the things that Greg was mentioning the other day, as a matter of fact. Now kids look askance at, um, you know, Hershey bars and Almond Joys. So that's old people candy, like Werther's Original. Why don't you get something real that I see advertised in Saturday morning cartoons like Twix or nerds or skittles or something like that 
we had a little bit of that in there. But uh, all right, fine by me. More almond joy for me. That's always pretty good uh, coming out of Halloween. Okay, so uh, as it turns out, there's also other news affecting millions, possibly billions of people around the world and their daily lives. So I thought we would maybe talk to Greg about some of those things uh, in addition to Halloween. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Hey, good morning. You know, so today is adult Halloween. Yeah, that's right. Today's the day you go through all the stuff your kids <laughs> you brought can't home eat that. and you throw out the stuff They're you don't want. Peanut butter. You eat the stuff you do want. Right. Uh, and it was a big day for hauling away uh, BB bats and, and Mary Janes and bit of honeys and things like that. Although I, I did of frequently honeys. eat yeah, those I, things. I, it's funny because, uh, you know, you go on Twitter and you see all the youngs, you know, yeah. arguing about, oh, I'm enjoying mounds are so old and I hate them and get rid of Milky Ways. And what we really yeah. need are That's Milky Twix Way. and That's Reese's. One. And those are the ones I throw out and I keep <laughs> all the other stuff first. Well, that, that's good. makes for a healthy market. That's good news if you if you go out on the open market with it and trade. Uh, yeah, I, I got some explanation of it. Some of, some things the kids told me. Some things my kids told me. Uh, kids that say, uh, "What is three musketeers? What is the, Why is that? Why three anything? And what what are musketeers? For one thing, we never read that or or even saw the movie. And I don't understand. And what is that substance in the middle oh, of what it? Is this baby Ruth all <laughs> right. about? Oh, yeah. Payday? What? Yeah. Um, you kids don't know Zagnut. I'm telling you, <laughs> you you missed out on all of these other things. Short lived yeah, candy like, bars know, in the seventies. You're Some too young for candy cigarettes, so you'll have to deal light. with uh, Baby Ruth. Yeah, well, Baby Ruth. Yeah, they're still in that uh, variety mix for old people. The Hershey variety mix. Uh, you know, forget about it, uh, Mister Good Bar. Like trying to explain that. Yeah. No chance. Or you know, there there's one you like, whatever it is. You yeah. know, maybe it's a it's a plain Hershey's. I do like that, and that's in the bag. Okay, it's in the bag, but there's one of those and seventy eight of the other kind you don't like because yeah. they automatically make them that way. I don't know how they know. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, and uh, my my grandparents used to have the sort of the cocktail assortment of them, not Halloween, but year round. It had the special dar- Hershey's special dark, which to kids is like poison, but yeah. Oh, well. Special black, right? <laughs> exactly. Oh, I can't believe this. Oh, which reminds me of what my grandparents used to have. Again, telling you how old. Yeah. They would have Charms Sour Balls. Wow. And it would come in a can. And it would be one of those things where, where the can opener was stuck to the top. And then you have to put the metal tab into the opener and then twist it around the top in oh, order to God. open it. <laughs> like sardines. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, all right. Right. And but you can't give those out at Halloween because the can right. has them individually stuck together so they come out as one giant right. sour ball that you can't eat. You know? <laughs> it's like ribbon candy. Oh, but you kids today, you don't know anything about candy. Oh well. Yeah. I mean uh, it changes. There's fashions, it changes with the times, but I think it was t- essentially we decided it was tied to advertising and uh, whether they advertise in the right places, Saturday morning cartoons or I guess now YouTube, who knows. Mm. Anyway, so uh, I'm enjoying. I've got some if you want. I can digitize it and upload it to you. Yeah, well, you know, it never goes bad. Right. It's like Wonder Bread. I think. So uh, let's start with this Des Moines Register poll. That was out this morning. All right. Okay. They it's give about out the corn already out decided there. Republican primary, but that's not the interesting part. Oh. That was yesterday, uh, the Republican primary. And, of course, uh, Trump is leading, and Nikki Haley is tied with uh, hmm? fading Ron DeSantis for second. Really? Okay. And why DeSantis doesn't drop out, I don't know. But uh, spent too much on boots. So here's what's interesting. Costs now, yes. Will legal issues stop Trump from beating Biden? What GOP caucus goers told our Iowa poll. Hmm. And it's uh, too long, and you didn't read it, and it's behind a paywall. Nearly two-thirds of Republican caucus goers say Donald Trump can win an election against Joe Biden regardless of his legal challenges. And that's really the key thing right there. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Why is Trump leading? Because when you get down to it, uh, whether it's in Iowa or anywhere else, the uh, sentiment on the side of the Republicans is Trump's really the only one that could beat Biden. And so we're going with him. Uh, We happen to love him anyway. Oh. He hates the people we hate, so we're all in. But it turns out I'm okay with that because I think he can beat Biden. Uh, 
Well, that's what they think. I mean, that's what they think, you know, and so I don't think he can. So I'm sort of okay with that part of it. I'm not okay with like you hate everything that, uh, you know, you should love. And if you win, Uh, it'll be terrible. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, the part that uh, they are convinced that they're going down the wrong path because they're convinced they could win, Hmm. uh, it's crazy. I mean, just take today. I mean, there's still this fraud trial going on. Yeah. It's November 1st. That means that the uh, Trump crime family gets to testify. Ooh. And although there's only an off-year election going on, it will be election day on everybody's refrigerator uh, NAFTA calendars. And they'll be in. They'll be spending election day in court testifying. Some of them. I mean, I don't know what the schedule is. Some of them go like tomorrow or eh. next day. I think uh, all Ivanka November goes on Friday day. or Thursday. She got a reprieve, so she didn't have to go. She's not a uh, you know a, a, a defendant. She got out of that I mean, she because she basically not. left the business to be a senior advisor to her father for the years that they're trying this uh, case for. And again, it's a civil case. So why is that important? It's important because when Don Jr. shows up and says, I can't remember anything, I plead the fifth. Because it's a civil case, the judge, remember, it's a bench case, not a trial, uh, a jury case. Oh, yeah. The judge can say, oh, you're pleading the fifth. That probably means you're guilty. Oh, because ah. in a Judges civil case, do that, you huh? could make some assumptions. You can't do that in a criminal case. Okay. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's I guess that's true. Uh, you're not depriving anybody of. Uh, their liberty, so yeah. I guess it's a, hmm, hmm, yeah, I'm sh- they must have probably said that at law school. Yeah, you you can make, how, how do they say in the legal profession, uh, theory of the case? Under no, arrest. no, some other thing that they say. Uh, oh, yes, it, you can make an, uh, you can make a, a an inference oh, from the okay. fact that they did a, uh, Fifth Amendment thing, and you can make it a negative inference. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Good. Oh, speaking of lawyers, you know, one of the kids who was trick-or-treating yesterday told me a lawyer joke. Mm -hmm. Uh, What do lawyers wear to court? Uh, Lawsuits. Hey. All right. Okay. So that's why we love to have trick-or-treaters come. They, they, you know, some of these things uh, are just timeless. Yes. Uh, Okay. True. Well, that one. Eh. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the, when kids tell it it's true it's look timeless. when the Trump crime family goes yeah, to uh, that's court true. they're wearing lawsuits they're all, all that's all they've got all of them true okay so, so you know that, when that, do we start seeing them again wear we're going back to the Jail Des Moines Register stuff. poll and what uh, Republican primary voters think yeah it's one thing to have lawsuits it's another thing to have guilty pleas yeah I and so you know this thing seeps into the body politic this thing seeps into the public Mm. and so when you and again adults learn by repetition let me say that again adults learn by repetition so when you keep hearing oh he was guilty oh he was guilty oh he was guilty Mm. oh all those people down in georgia they're all pleading guilty yes maybe there's something to it maybe he's guilty you know that that does sink in at least in georgia yeah republican primary voters two-thirds of them may be uh, unreachable, but one-third mm. of them, you know, maybe maybe you can get to them. Yeah. Oh, you know what that reminds me of is, uh, <clears throat> I, I wonder, they should ask the New York uh, Republican congressional delegation whether all of these people who were lawyers for Trump pleading guilty is good enough evidence for them to say, uh, oh, I don't know, impeach Trump again, or that he's guilty because all of his lawyers are pleading guilty the way they are with George Santos. Well, ask, ask them their uh, opinion curious. about the Colorado case. No. Because after all, oh. the Colorado case right. is the one that is actually allowed to go forward and is currently happening. The 14th Amendment one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So that doesn't mean that uh, we win and Trump can't run in that particular state and or other states. But what happens, even if it's turned uh, around on appeal, what if what if we win? Hmm. That, well. I mean, again, he's guilty. Oh, he must have yeah. done an insert because he was found in court and he did. Yeah. This is a courtroom. And he was you found know. that way. So a whole lot of stuff there. I mean, they're hoping for the opposite so that they can say, well, it, you know, a court has decided he's not guilty. But Right. Hmm. 
I don't uh, know about that. The role, asked about the Odessa? role of the former president and the future of the Republican Party. 28% of likely GOP caucus goers say Trump was a good president, but it's time to consider other leaders. Uh, 32% say the <laughs> party needs a new leader with better personal behavior and a different approach. <laughs> But uh, that's a new category. Of the party think they should move on. Okay. However, they think he could beat Trump. Hmm. That's actually encouraging. Yeah. As opposed to, look, we're fascists and we like what he stands for. Oh, yeah, right. We, we don't love that message. I, I like these new categories that they've come up with in the in the polling. You don't hear those very frequently. I think he's a good president, but he has terrible personal behavior <laughs> or something. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe they maybe they pulled that out in the way well, you know, the you Clinton to, impeachment. Yeah, they there's the open-ended stuff where you could say whatever you want, like, you know, I think he was a good president, but, you know, he's in diapers, so I don't think we should be uh, voting for him anymore. <laughs> eh, eh, that, that too. Uh, they can invent any category they like. It's just they usually stick with the same ones. I know. And new and good. All right. So uh, the title of the pundit roundup oh. is "A Week from Election Day." Hmm, Some right. of the signals and signs are unclear, and we're going to turn to our favorite Simon Rosenberg, the uh, Hopium Chronicles Certainly guy. Certainly our favorite Simon. We like Simon. A week to Election Day. Okay, peeps, we're officially a week out. I checked in with David Pepper this morning. He says the Ohio early voting is encouraging. Governor Andy Bashir looks good in Kentucky. I've seen Brandon enough. Presley's closing strong in Mississippi. Bashir will probably win in Kentucky. Presley will probably lose in Mississippi, but you never know. Mm -hmm. Because in general, and I uh, got an article about this, uh, mm -hmm. the idea, and this is uh, from Politico, that the Democrats always lose in the South may not be true. I mean, there's Doug Jones. You have the occasional winner. Yeah, Democrats have true. two big governor races in Trump states next week. Statewide Democrats in red states are a dying breed. Can they learn anything from Andy Bashir and Brandon Presley? Well, Brandon Presley is a relatively conservative Dem who's running fairly strongly against Tate Reeve and probably will lose just because it's Mississippi. Mm. But Tate Reeve is so terrible. He's pretty bad. And meshed in scandal that uh, Presley has a chance at least. And Bashir is actually popular. Yeah. So uh, he's so popular that Republicans have changed the way they run against him. Hmm. Instead of trying to convince people you hate these this guy when you don't, you know, it's more like, well, he's a good guy, but hmm. uh, which gives you an idea of how that race is going. I guess. Uh, all right. Well, so, good for you know, him. look, if Bashir loses and if uh, Virginia uh, State Senate in particular flips, uh, next week, everybody will say this is a terrible sign for Democrats. Obviously, Biden is pulling them down. But if Bashir he wins, as he's likely to, yes, and the Democrats keep the state Senate, which I think they're likely to, it's the mm -hmm. House that's really not so clear, but maybe they take that too. Cool. Then, of course, it had nothing to do with Joe Biden. Right. Oh, it was because that's else the way or politics something works. Else. Uh, that's the country works anyway. Huh. Or it's a recession. There's always that. Well, you know, if they if the Democrats do well, it yes. can't possibly have anything yeah, either to do with Biden right. or the Democratic Party. No. But if they lose, it's all Biden's fault. Yeah. That you, you know, did that. You have to understand that that's the way pundits and the New York Times approaches politics. Yeah. Always. Uh, right. We're used to that. I mean, it's not good, uh, but we're we're we've grown accustomed to it. Well, I'm okay with them winning and then having the explanatory articles. How did this happen even though Joe Biden is president? Uh, okay. Right. Yeah, and, and I'm okay this. with them winning. I don't know, honestly, if we can win those contests, but, uh, say whatever start you winning, want. winning and then we can worry about how it's covered. Yeah. That's the main thing. And I, Okay, if the newspaper coverage of the fact that he won or the Democrats won is wrong, uh, that's all right in, in comparison. Like, right. would I rather have them report it correctly and lose? No. Simon also points out because, you know, you get this doom and gloom because that's the machine. Biden's approval rating. I know there's been chatter that Biden's standing with Democrats has taken a hit over Israel, but that's just not showing up in the in the data. As I wrote on Saturday, oh. support for Israel among Democrats has actually gone up since October 7th. Oh, our friend Dana Hull points out there's a lot of Republicans writing in saying I'll never vote for Biden now. But they did. Uh, you know, in 2020, we saw that with the focus groups that Sarah Longwell did. There are Republicans who just couldn't bring themselves to vote for Trump, so they voted for Biden. They're 
bitterly disappointed with him because it turns out he's not a Republican after all. However, oh. if they have to run against Trump, who now has a bunch of court cases under his belt where he's guilty, uh, you know, we'll have to see what happens. We don't know that yet. Biden's approval rating in the 538 average is actually a point higher than a month ago. So if things are moving against Biden, we'd see it in the weekly trackers. And the first one out this week, morning consult, is Biden's head to head against Trump and his approval on handling of Israel unchanged. Now, okay. there's some terrible things happening there. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm not trying to, to minimize them. Well, that doesn't speak But to the that. assumption that that automatically redounds to Biden's uh, detriment uh, isn't seen yet, at least in the data. No. That's his point. And it's not hard to believe that uh, wherever there's a terrible situation, Donald Trump could make it worse. Mm. He's quite accomplished at that. So. Well, again, he's not running against perfection. Uh, you know, if only a right. different president with a younger one <laughs> yeah, yeah. would be peace in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, really? Instead, it's well, it, a known quantity. We George know Bush this was person. younger. Uh, well, everybody was younger, as it turns than, out. Than Biden, you know. Yeah. And uh, did we have peace in the Middle East? No, actually, right. we did not. Ah, but we, did, we didn't even have peace in the Middle East when George Washington was president. So come on. Uh, but what we needed is a younger George Washington. Yes. Right. With, if only uh, that had happened, everything would be okay. Right. The other thing that uh, Simon covers is Speaker Stumbling bigly right out of the box. In his first consequential act as Speaker, Mike Johnson has decoupled Israel-Ukraine funding, something opposed by Senate and House Democrats and Mitch McConnell. Demanded yeah. in exchange for something as serious as providing Israel aid in the middle of an active war, the Democrats cut funding to the IRS, allowing wealthy Americans to more easily cheat on their taxes. It doesn't save money. It loses money. They lie to you and say it saves money, but it doesn't. That's because their donors want you to think that. Yeah. Right? Turned Israel funding into a deeply partisan political football, something the pro-Israel community has fought to prevent from happening for decades. We've seen that with vaccines, too. The medical wow. community tried to make vaccination nonpartisan. You know, we saw yeah. how that has gone. Mm-hmm. Oh, well. You know, and again, it's not both sides. One side has decided to do this. Yes. So... It's you can't Republican blame Washington. Side. You can't blame the pandemic. You know, the Republican Party has done this. And yeah. that needs to be made clear. Uh, all right. I'm willing to give time on this show to make that clear. I think you've done it. Right. This diminution of our security responsibilities in the Middle East is part of a much broader pattern of MAGA undermining and degrading our global capacities in time of rising tensions. Look, if you want to be nice and persuasive, you say it's MAGA doing it, not Republicans. That's fine. I'm OK with that. I accept that friendly amendment. In a new video produced right. by Morning Joe, watch Trump say he's pulling the U.S. out of NATO, praise Victor Orban, <laughs> the European leader closest to Putin, and reinstate the Muslim ban. Uh -huh. So it's within that context we have to remember what else Republicans are doing right now to diminish and degrade American global power Everything. and undermine democracy here at home. They're blocking hundreds of Pentagon appointees through Tommy Tuberville. Mm -hmm. They're blocking over 60 State Department appointments. I think that's through Rand Paul, including 38 ambassadorships and ambassadors to Egypt, Israel, Jordan, and Lebanon, as if that's relevant right now. Makes uh, far harder to achieve diplomatic solutions to our global challenges when you don't have ambassadors there. Yes. We want peace. Okay, so we'll we then support not supporting Republicans so that you can get some ambassadors there so they can do their ambassador thing. Yes. Uh, we said, they said you know, ambassadors on are honest people who lie for their country, but sometimes there's a role yeah. for that. Yes. Uh, well, uh, yeah, always a bad time to – well, it's always a bad time to not have an ambassador somewhere, but it, it can get worse, like if there's general warfare in the region. Right. Uh, so while uh, Biden is, is doing some amazingly good things on uh, artificial intelligence, Republicans are trying to block uh -huh. critical cybersecurity legislation. They're fighting additional aid to Ukraine and supporting Ukrainian genocide. Excuse the Trump theft and wanton dissemination of American secrets, elevate insurrectionists. Uh, so, yeah, it's all bad. And that's the kind of stuff you have to remind people when it comes to election time. And here's an interesting uh, thread in that regard from Dave Darmafal. Uh, political scientist in South Carolina, right. who points out, by the way, that Dean Phillips disrespecting James Clyburn is incredibly stupid if you actually want to win Democratic primaries. Oh, uh, I didn't notice that happening. But okay. Oh, he did. Well, I don't really care what Jim well, Clyburn thinks. What does he know? Oh, <laughs> all right. Uh, or or words respect. That? Well, okay. Uh, and, you know, it, it got to the point it was so bad 
that uh, you know, actually, uh, the scandal sheets noticed hmm. that uh, that he had said that, and it was that's like, hard to do. Yeah, I mean, they they noticed something a Democrat said. Oh, Here's a political Phillips, playbook on especially. on uh, Dean Phillips from Doug Jones. All right. Former Alabama Senator Doug Jones shared a particularly spicy clapback with Playbook this morning. With all due respect to the misguided gentleman from Minnesota, there's likely no one in the Democratic Party or the country who knows better about black voters and their fundamental role they play than Jim Clyburn. What a deeply insulting and frankly wildly off-base thing to say. But I guess that's the advice you get when you have a Republican running your campaign. Oh. Steve Schmidt. The reality is Phillips' bizarre effort running for president in the only state without delegates and with virtually zero support, which is to say New Hampshire, appears to be floundering less than a week after its launch and throwing insults at one of the most revered and accomplished members of our party certainly isn't going to revive it. So that's how things are going for Dean Phillips. Uh, All right. Good job right out of the gate. Which, of course, translates as Democrats deeply concerned about Dean Phillips. They must be because they're commenting on him. I see. Okay. They've well, just they're concerned about him saying offhandedly things dismissed about Jim him as a gnat that you mm. swat away. That's not deeply concerned about him. Just for the record, just so you know. Okay. So we'll do Dave Darmanfell's uh, <clears throat> uh, tweet thread on yes. Joe Biden and his comparison with Harry Truman oh. after the break. All right. Well, that's a good time for it. So Dean Phillips, uh, there's a Dean Phillips bonanza, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, people yeah, are going you crazy. get tired of Mike Johnson, there's Dean Phillips. There's always yeah. somebody you could uh, uh, look at and say, oh, what is this with this guy? Now, I had to contact college, the college boy about this because uh, last year when he was still high school boy, he was taking a government course. They all had to choose a member of Congress to profile for some reason. And it's funny because as almost as a joke, he chose somebody that... <laughs> No one had no, ever heard of. heard of. He did Dean Mike Phillips. No, Dean Phillips. And so now he's like the world's leading expert in Dean Phillips. He should be uh, looking for journalism's jobs uh, maybe over the summer. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time just to tell you again another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air and Patreon.com. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad. Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself... The gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't, do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon too. Thanks for all your support. All right, welcome back now to the K Grown in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue on. Oh, look at this. I actually only hit snooze on the last uh, alarm here. So to uh, avoid having it go off in the middle of the next segment, do a little uh, button pushing. Okay, let's continue on. We had we were teased with a, a thread coming up. By Dave Darmafell. Okay, is that Political what's scientist. up next? The thread All on right. the amazing similarities Excellent. between Harry Truman and Joe Biden. Oh, Remember, yeah. they're not exactly alike. Oh, Harry Truman is uh, considerably older and and uh, somewhat dead. Yes, mostly. Right. Uh, uh, Biden is older now than Harry Truman was when he was fourteen. So you know, I don't know how well that comparison works. <laughs> Still, but astonishingly both plain spoken Democrats consistently underestimated by people across the political spectrum and by the press, especially by the press. Both faced the do-nothing Republican Congress. Both faced challenges within their party from a far left that was viewed as naive and unserious on foreign policy and Mm. from conservative Democrats who felt they were moving too quickly on issues of racial justice. 
Both were also ah. underestimated by their mm. fellow Democrats who contrasted them negatively against their more charismatic Democratic predecessors. Both presidencies were focused on rebuilding the nation at home and rebuilding an international order focused on the rule of law. And, you know, I said this one, one of Biden's problems is that he's not performative, you know, yes. the way, let's say, Obama was. They both fought Nazis. Europe, the Middle East, and Asia yes. were hotspots in both presidencies, both highly valued NATO, international alliances, both dealt with economic yes. transition, both experienced strong economic growth and rising inflation during their presidencies. Both were focused on giving workers a fair deal. Both were stalwart supporters of Israel. Both were incredibly consequential presidents, underestimated at the time, whose work was focused on building a lasting foundation for the future. And both think, uh, and people think both are giving people hell when both are simply telling the truth and people <laughs> thought it was hell. Okay. So, sort of interesting. I do yeah, think Biden well tends done. to be underestimated. If he wins again, you know, it, he'll still be underestimated. Yes. It doesn't it matter. It won't matter as wins. much, right. Yes, that's true. Uh, it, it's a, it's a good list. It takes, I started to worry that this was sort of like a horoscope, Chinese fortune cookie generalism, but uh, that's a long list and. You know, you could, uh, you, I'm certainly, you could dispute some of them as well. And, and there's points of contrast because as it turns out, they are different people. But yeah, I, no, I, like but the I, I think presented. the main point there is that from the press's perspective, they're plain spoken, not mm. all of that, uh, exciting, uh, uh, kind of personalities that they hate because it doesn't give them clicks mm. and they can't do gotcha interviews because it doesn't work. And so they hate them. So they want somebody right. better, better for them. Yeah, I I get the comparison. All right, and that's a it's a long list. Okay, uh, I mean take it for what it's worth. They're all uh, pundits are constantly trying to come up with what uh, if you can't invent a new demographic voter group name, then the hot thing to do right, is to say which election are we moms. doing over again? It's or, the, it's uh, the nineteen forty eight Republicans. There's a group. Yes, <laughs> that's true too. They tend to vote. Pretty solidly Republican, though. But yes, uh, the, that the second hottest thing to do is to say that we're, this is really the 1918 midterm elections all over again. Oh, is it? All right. Why so? Uh, you know, that's exactly the comparison that immediately came to mind when you were saying that. Yeah, right. Everyone knows that. Well, what happened in 1918? I don't know. Spanish flu, I guess. This is uh, the New Republic. Uh, uh, speaking of Dean Phillips and uh, Mike Johnson and other people you never heard of. Uh, this one is under the uh, subheading Virginia Ham, and it's a oh. piece about Glenn Youngkin. <laughs> Glenn Youngkin's presidential dreams will be decided next Tuesday. President if Republicans Trump sweep next week's there. elections, he's probably in, and he's more affable and appealing than Trump. Don't let that fool you, says Norm Ornstein. I don't think they're no. going to sweep, but, you know, I, there it yeah, is. Don't let that fool you either, right. Uh, okay, well, look at that. He's not even wearing his vest. That uh, yeah. He looks evil in that photo. Wearing a suit. Affably evil, though. Oh, yes. Sure. It's sort of friendly, like uh, lawful evil, I guess they would say. for Dungeons Right. And, and this Americans. is Senate. We're doing elections. This is Senate, not uh, presidential. Uh, but it caught my eye because there were a couple of internal polls that came out from the different camps. Hmm. All right. I don't know where you stand in terms of whether or not uh, uh, Ruben Gallego and, and uh, Carrie Lake, who's nuts. All right. And Kirsten Cinema walk in a bar, kind of awesome. and the bartender has to decide who to vote for. <laughs> and you know, uh, why the long face? <laughs> so, so the question is, which one of them Mr. do you want to vote for? And and do you think Cinema hurts Gallego, or do you uh, think Cinema hurts Lake? This has been a debate that's been going on. And uh, Chuck Schumer threw his support behind cinema because yada, 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 whatever mm. reasons. I mean, again, party leaders in Congress yeah. in general support the incumbent no matter what. And then it takes something special for them not to see Mike Johnson with uh, George Santos. Yeah. But is it, 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 um, <sighs> But now she's an independent. So what does right. that mean? I mean, ordinarily, that that's the sort of thing that will undo it. Like, OK, I'm not in your party anymore. Oh, well, well I'm you know, Paul's leader, having her so. losing also might do it. This is from uh, Punchbowl. Kirsten Sinema is in third place and trailing badly in the three way Senate race in Arizona, according to an internal GOP poll shared with Republican senators today by NRSC chair Steve Daines. Steve Daines is an establishment Republican who's trying to recruit normies 
to run in the various senatorial categories. And unfortunately, wise. he's got Carrie Lake. Uh, well, yeah. So he didn't recruit her. That's not a normie. And he was stuck with her. Right. But, okay. Vago has 41%. Carrie Lake has 37%. And Cinema comes in at 17 I see. Now, well, interestingly, Dane's made the case that it's basically a statistical tie. It's not. <laughs> she's trailing, oh, bad, but, uh, you know, for, for Carrie Lake. Yeah, uh, like, you what know, are you talking uh, about? She's trailing somewhat, but she loses. Cinema is trailing badly. Now, that was a Republican internal poll. Okay. Again, the numbers. Uh, 41, 37, 17. Mm-hmm. Okay. PPP polls did a Gallego internal. Okay. 41, 36, 15. All right. That's so both camps, close. internal polls, have Ruben Gallego, the Democrat, winning 41, Carrie Lake at 36, Gerson Cinema 15. Mm-hmm. Cinema is trailing really, really badly. By the way, if there's a head to head because Cinema decides not to run, Gallego oh, beats Carrie Lake 48 43 in the PPP Democratic <laughs> internal poll. Mm-hmm. And in the Republican poll, Gallego beats Lake 49 44. Same numbers. All right. So, uh, no, Kirsten Cinema is not hurting the Democrats. Mm. All right. That's. Uh, Just so you know. I guess I, I, I would have guessed that there was some ding there, but I guess not. I guess people are done with her. People are done with her. People are done with her on both sides. Yeah. Republicans don't want her because she's not Republican enough. Again, she's not Joe Manchin, who, as we uh, talked about on the break, uh, doesn't have a heart. He has a lump of coal where his heart Mm. should be. I think that Kirsten Sinema's heart's in the right place. However, she's been co-opted by Republican money. So what she's Mm. done in her role as senator is try to be a bridge between the Democratic and Republican parties, Uh, you know, uh, but uh, having a bridge from like America to hell, <laughs> yeah, we don't want it that. may be a bridge, but maybe it's a bridge too far. I mean, it's, she she has good relations with Republicans and can sometimes bring one or two of them along for a specific no, small thing, even. where in she therefore takes credit for saving America. Mm-hmm. Oh well, but. Uh, you know, not so much. Manchin, I'm not sure what he does. No. I mean, he votes more with appointments than not for Democrats, so there's that. But I'm just saying, if we replace Kirsten Cinema with Gallego, I don't think we lose. No, that's a huge upgrade. I think it's an upgrade. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's uh, If we our... replace Manchin with anybody, we lose. Uh, yes, unless for some reason... Uh, that person switches to the Democratic Party at the end. Yeah. Uh, you well, know we'll what? what Re- Republicans suck. Like maybe it's Jim Justice. He's been in both parties, right? Yeah, right. I mean, he's terrible, but okay. Well, at any rate, yeah, that's true. Uh, generally speaking, he's going to be running as a Democrat regardless, and he will. He co- he goes to the caucus meetings and eats the lunch and votes. Yeah, Senator for... doesn't go to the caucus meetings yeah. anymore, does she? Uh, right. I mean, that was before she became independent. Uh, I think she stopped going. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, people Cause, were angry. Because people would try to badger her by trying to persuade her to change her mind, and she hated that. So yeah, I don't like to. Use why my you're mind. in the Senate if that's what you hate? I don't know. Mm. Don't know. No, it was never any understanding of what she was doing anywhere, honestly. But she wants to go back to being in triathlons, and it's fine by me. If she right. does. So you know, when you look at as Simon Rosenberg did, look at the list of things that. Uh, Democrats do that people don't love, but then you turn around and look at the things that Donald Trump would do if he were in power. Yeah. Here's another one for the list. This is from the New York Times this morning. Trump's allies want a new style of lawyer if he returns to power. Politically appointed lawyers sometimes frustrated Donald Trump's ambitions. His allies are planning to install more aggressive legal gatekeepers if he regains the White House. I see. More Jeff Clark's. You know, less, uh, uh, less else. Patsy Baloney's. I guess so. Huh. Well, yeah, uh, that's uh, interesting. Like, I guess uh, we got to they have to look around for more lawyers who say things like, you know, who's dumb judges and the Constitution. Yeah. I hate them. They're so stupid. They should be listening to either Donald Trump or me, possibly. 
right? Uh, or Prager U. I mean, that or, oh, or yeah. Alex Jones. That's where we should get all of our information from. <laughs> yeah, the Allies have been drawing up sure. lists of lawyers they view as ideologically and temperamentally suited to serve in a second Trump administration. They Their aim is to strategy. reduce the chances that politically appointed lawyers would frustrate a more radical White House agenda as they sometimes mm-hmm. did when Mr. Trump was in office by raising objections to his desires for certain harsher immigration policies or for greater personal control over the Justice Department, among others. The Justice Department is supposed to be independent, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, treating migrants as objects that you can razor wire and drown. I mean, this is what he's running on. Yes. Uh, in, in, you know, no more Muslims. We'll stop the ones who are coming and we'll get rid of the ones who are now. You want to vote for me? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. I will eat you. That. He tells it like it is, said the sheep. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing about this article, though, uh, well, besides, you know, the main thesis, was that they were saying uh, this – they need a list. They're preparing a list of lawyers that would be friendly to a second Trump administration – and, you know, your first instinct, if you've been paying attention to anything for the past couple of years, is, well, but they, they had that list last time. Uh, but it was from yes, the Federal Society. Right. I hate them now. And, right. And, of course, what's funny is we all obviously came to hate the Federalist Society because they were doing such damage to the judiciary and the practice of law in this country. But this article says, oh, no, no, we're not using the uh, Federalist Society list. Those guys are uh, rhinos and liberals. We want serious conservatives. So it's it was interesting. Like uh, I, I mean, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy that Leonard Leo would find himself frozen out. But I'm not positive that's going to end up happening. He may just adjust his list and say, "Oh, we'll find crazier people." But it's interesting that they uh, are interested in developing their own list and freezing the Federalist Society out. Those are the guys who believe in the rule, ultimately in the rule of law and the value of precedent. And that's stupid. We want to get past that and uh, uh, install judges and lawyers at the Justice Department who believe that what is lasting and valuable is not the law as developed through practice in court, but Stuff that we want to have happen and that Donald Trump says would be really cool. That should be the basis of our law. That should be our Constitution. Right. And and uh, underlying that, you know, unspoken is that and of course, they have to be uh, severe loyalists. Yeah. Uh, and OK with execution if they're not. So uh, this companion article in Rolling Stone is uh, Trump's demands for companions. extreme loyalty are starting to backfire. Uh, if I went to jail for Donald Trump, says a former administration official, I don't think he would even give me a lifetime Mar-a-Lago membership. <laughs> no, he wouldn't give you anything. Are you kidding? Right. He's certainly not going to give me a pardon. No, and that's for sale, too. And he's too. certainly not going to pay for my legal expenses. Oh, forget that. No, you're not getting any money out of So I'm getting nothing Donald from Trump. So why am he I doing this? He doesn't have any, and if he did, he wouldn't give it to you. As he's facing know. an array of criminal charges, Trump's <clears throat> demands for aides and lawyers to martyr themselves for him hasn't saved him. If anything, it's done the opposite driving several possible key witnesses to consider throwing Trump under the bus before he gets a chance to do it to them. Hmm. That's because, as is often the case with the former president, the notion of extreme loyalty goes one way. Rolling Stone spoke to seven potential witnesses, former Trump confidence, ensnared in the Fulton County, Georgia, and federal criminal probes, their legal advisors, and other sources familiar with the situation. All of them say that Trump's willingness to hang them out to dry has fueled legal strategies focused on self-preservation. Now, we can see that with Sidney Powell, with Ken Chesbro, with, uh, I forget his name, Scott Hall, whoever the the local guy in the Coffee County thing is, Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, Jenna Ellis, and there'll be more. Three of the sources say that Team Trump's comically unsettled search for patsies like Baloney. Patsy Baloney, yeah. and Fall Guys, MAGA diehards who would take the blame and possible prison sentences in lieu of Trump. Now, Patsy Baloney was not that. Uh, no, he wanted to be out of prison. That is wise. But that drove a larger wedge between the ex-president and many of his former fellow travelers. Oh. If I went to jail for Donald Trump, if I did that, what would he do for me and my family? I'm thinking of the Godfather. No thing. Yes. Right. I don't want you to testify in front of the Senate. Think about your family. Oh. Do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, well, they're not going to do anything for your families. or they, they might grind them into hamburger and eat them. Right. Lawyer Sidney Powell, for example, put her adulation of Trump to work in the aftermath of the election by filing bogus lawsuits, 
and making bizarre false claims against voting machine company Dominion. The moves got her sanctioned by a Michigan court, sued for a billion dollars by Dominion, and charged alongside Trump in Fulton County. But her legal ordeal has brought her no meaningful help from the former president. Trump has gone out of her way to claim publicly he was never his attorney. Other Trump <laughs> allies have worked to try to pin the blame for any criminal wrongdoing on her. Right. She has since also taken a plea deal this month, a move that shocked a number of Trump lawyers and loyalists. Trump's communications aide, Liz Harrington, has recently claimed the former president was confused by his allies' plea deals because there's no crimes here. Hmm. And Powell, for her part, just like Mark Meadows, is still trying to have it both ways, portraying herself as a victim of zealous prosecution and as a stalwart defender of Trump's election lies. Mark Meadows is simply trying to keep a low profile and giving prosecutors the absolute bare minimum for what they want and trying to give them nothing else. Doesn't right. say that in the article here, but that's what he's doing. Right. Well, but as some contemplate rational. potentially cooperating with authorities, others have already publicly flipped the decision Trump now associates with weaklings who betray him, like mm. Jenna Ellis. Yeah, you weakling who betrays him. Yeah. Uh, all right. He's that's the kind of person he is. Yeah, he'll, right. he'll get so no help. So let's from recruit him. more people to join the administration that we're confident <laughs> we're going to win because look at those Republicans in Iowa telling us that that's the case. And look at the polls. Everybody knows mm. we're clobbering the guy who the campaign hasn't started yet. And besides, we're going to win in uh, court on all these things. And here's another couple of magical thinking things we're going to do. And at the same time, uh, we're going to recruit these loyalists by pointing out that uh, loyalty only goes one way. That's right. So when push comes to shove, you guys are getting thrown under the bus. Who wants to volunteer? Me. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I guess uh, they haven't heard the news or they put it out of their mind or or their news sources are just different. And, uh, you know, I guess it comes around to bite them. If you, you know, not watching real news that says this is what Donald Trump does to people, then you won't learn that. Mm. And uh, to the extent that you are aware that others have been thrown under the bus, it's basically, saying, oh, well, great, more room on the road for me. I'll never be thrown under the bus. Right. So. Uh, you know, again, you step back and you think, OK, it's one thing for Biden to run against reality. He's always going to lose. Because uh, the reality is things happen that he doesn't have much control over. And even those that he does have control over, he may or may not do the thing you want him to do. But then when you're running against Trump, mm-hmm. it's what would Biden do versus what would Trump do? Yeah. Well, we should and, be asking you know, that question. Pick an issue. Probably the hottest one right now is Israel. Trump clearly would bear hug Netanyahu and then throw him under the bus. Hmm, wait a minute. Well, if you don't like the way Israel is approaching <laughs> Gaza, perhaps you don't want somebody who's going to bear hug uh, Netanyahu. I mean, no, but that second part was sounded good. It sounded good, but what do you have to do to get from here to there? Yeah, I guess this is a question. Uh, yeah, but is it, if the way, yeah, we'll have to be careful about how we put that because, like, I know. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, Let's just Netanyahu nuke Gaza. Under a bus. That's what, you know. Huh. Well, what, that'll put him under a bus. Uh, you have to look and too. say, well, okay, tell me your strategy. Tell me what you would do. Oh, no, no. That's not going to happen. Uh, what what Donald – I mean, Donald Trump's never going to tell you that. We'll, we'll make great deals. Say? We'll do – we have to make a great Middle East deal, I guess. I don't know. That's what he did in 2016. Maybe that's dated now. So, yeah, especially yeah. if he gets a fraud conviction. Yeah. Oh, well, that's true. So, I mean, maybe he's beyond that and he'll – Say something more bizarre. That seems harmless now. Well, he's saying a we'll bunch of bizarre deal. stuff. So we could put know, him I'm in just Greenland. Saying, you know, we don't we don't know how that works out. You can't game it out yet. You don't know how that. You don't know how the war is going to go. You don't know what else is going to happen. You right. don't know what Trump is going to say. And so you know, don't I'll assume anything. Greenland That's why you know when Simon Rosenberg says I'm looking at the polls and they're not changing. Yeah. You know, take that to the bank for right now, and then we'll see what happens. Okay. Yeah. Well, certainly anything. Yeah. Uh, although maybe we finally get to uh, uh, maybe Jay Rosen ends up being happy. Where now we'll finally have a stakes versus horse race reporting. It would be interesting. I wonder how how exciting horse race reporting would be in a Biden Trump rematch versus how much more titillating the well. Here's what'll happen if Trump wins reporting. I mean, yeah, Rosen may get his wish. Yeah, we shall see. In the meantime, uh, uh, Daily Beast points out the Democrats have a new 
anti-abortion foil for 2024. His name is Mike Johnson. He is, in a lot of ways, a caricature of everything Democrats would have wanted to say about Republicans, one Democratic strategist said of the new speaker, which is true. Uh, And so, you know, it's one of those situations where you say, remember everything we said about Trump in 2016? It's true. Uh Aha. Look at him. Remember everything we said about him in 2020? It's true. Look at him. True. You know, so on the one hand and on the other hand, and about Republicans, everything we said about them is also true. They're supporting Trump. And we just talked about Trump. And now what do they do? They pick a MAGA Mike guy to run the House. And he's everything you dislike about Republicans. Everything. Yeah. From the Christian dominionism to his stance on abortion to his chance his stance on uh the gays. Even his name stupid it. face. Oh, well, you know, true actually. I mean people Yeah, uh, he looks like the kind of guy that you would concoct in a lab to to do Republican stuff. So that's gonna happen. All right. So that's the Daily Beast piece. And so uh, what do they have in Vanity Fair? Oh, this is Molly John Fast. Welcome to MAGA Mike's house. Mike Johnson, oh. until recently a Louisiana backbencher, isn't as cartoonishly Trumpy as Matt Gates or frothing on Fox News like Jim Jordan, but he's perhaps even more dangerous, a zealot in an unassuming suit. Hmm. Oh, I thought we were going to get a tour of his house. Uh, mean the house no lawsuits, him, just so. like regular three-piece suits. <clears throat> okay. Uh, very often they, uh, at this point in the in uh, after the election yeah, someone will tour their their home and uh see whether or not they have granite countertops etc yeah but no okay then she meant the house of representatives welcome to his house huh okay uh it was vanity fair it was even odds that they were going to profile his his you know the actual home but uh i guess we wait for that one by the way, I'm looking at the picture that comes with the uh, Rolling Stone piece, Trump entering, I guess, coming on stage somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that they have, uh, I, I don't know whether he's coming up, it, it looked like maybe two steps up or something to the stage, but he's got handrails on either side. I wonder if that's his oh, He scares commanders. stairs. Yeah. So, he doesn't like germs. He's scared of stairs. <laughs> right. Oh, by the way, yeah, that's bad news for germophobes to have to use the handrails everywhere they go. But yeah. hand sanitizer, it's, it's that season again, so... It's always a good idea, uh, especially if you're, uh, you know, an older guy and maybe carrying around a little extra weight. Right. Just saying. So uh, our friend Bill in Portland, Maine, talks oh. about uh, some of the reasons he to vote for corn? Trump. Oh. And the comment that he got from that uh, is even more interesting. Uh, not that Bill isn't always interesting, but his experience, decency, guts, work ethic, lack of scandals, effective, accomplished cabinet, emergency management skills, judicial picks, Relationship with world leaders, new and old, his dedication to saving our democracy, all reasons to vote for him. And uh, a woman named Julianne Andrine writes in and said, well said, Bill, when President Biden was in the Senate, I was a lead staffer on reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, which Mm. we co-authored with him. He was an expert at legislating and achieving consensus, and he was respectful and kind to all. Great leader, great POTUS. So, again, Uh there's going to be a contrast between him and Trump. That isn't in existence right now, which is, again, one of the reasons why it's tough to look at the polls and say, well, what does that mean? Hmm. All right. Yeesh. Uh, blah. All right. That wasn't as no. – <clears throat> I, I thought there was going to be some surprise humorous twist to the end of that. No, I mean, just look. Just I mean, straight we're, ahead. We're, he's a he's decent better. guy, and there's nothing you can do about it. Oh. In fact, he's so decent, James Comer is having second thoughts about this whole impeachment hearing stuff. Is he? Yeah, he said, you know, I don't, I don't know. And this is the quote. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. <laughs> you mean serve in Congress or? <laughs> no, have these impeachment oh. hearings. All right. Well, uh, not working out the way he wants. He so, just gets ridiculed. Who for cares? Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I'm surprised that That's that would move quote. him at all. I mean, he's not well, you know, stopping he may be with told the he has to. I'm not saying that they're going to stop. But what I am saying is that it's pretty obvious even oh. to Republicans. It's not doing what they want it to do. Yeah. This is not the Benghazi hearings. But he continues with the uh, to level the attacks and make these accusations. So Look, I'm Donald, curious uh, as to why he doesn't Joe wanna... Biden actually lent somebody money and they paid him back. That's yeah. scandalous. Well, it is to Republicans. What are you paying them back for? Are you crazy? What's wrong yeah. with you? you Donald just... Trump would know that you don't pay people back. One, keep the you money. If you do, you pay him one cent on the dollar. Right. It's good and for you. Tell you. Him, if you don't like it, sue me. You keep the money, so and it's, it's good for somewhere. them because it's a tax write-off. So why are you paying back loans? Aha! You must be some sort of Democrat or possibly an LGBTQ plus witch. 
right? I guess. I don't know. All right. Well, that's that's unusual. I'm just yeah. I'm confused. Comer is not stopping the accusations, and they're as dumb as ever. But why he's af- I don't know what he's afraid or bored with the impeachment thing, or just maybe he found out oh it's not going to work, and then it'll reflect poorly on me. It's better to just threaten it a lot and and insinuate that there's something wrong and let people draw their own conclusions. Why draw a legal conclusion that's binding that they can point to and say, I guess they were wrong about that? Well, you know, I think from his point of view, he's done his job. It's clearly devastating. We're done. Let's just wrap it up and move on. All right. I mean, I don't know what else he thinks he's going to do with his life. But uh, that was making him a star in Republican circles, and I don't know. But it wasn't. Um, I mean, that's the thing. Oh. He wasn't a star in Republican circles. People that's... were saying, why is this going so badly? Hmm. You know, same thing they said about uh, Jim Jordan and his weaponization committee stuff. Yeah. I guess Chuck Grassley just gets to level accusations and then say, but the impeachment is not my problem yet, so it's not going to reflect poorly on me. I think he's a criminal, but it's up to the House to do their job first. Is that why he right. gets away with it? Or just that he's crazy? I don't know. The announcement, this is from uh, the Daily Beast, hmm. which wraps this up uh, in a kind of a funny way. All right. It says, the announcement way. that Comer wants to quickly finish up his probe into the Biden crime family comes a week after he admitted he didn't want to hold any more public hearings, claiming he can do more with depositions. Hmm. In the inquiries only hearing last month, Comer was roundly mocked after his own witnesses <laughs> said there wasn't enough ev- evidence to support an impeachment. Appearing on serial uh, plagiarist Benny Johnson's YouTube show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's how they all well should put. be written up. Sure. Comer repeated his familiar mantra that the House GOP's investigation had found evidence to support their allegations of bribery uh-huh. and the president uh, criminally profiting from his family's foreign business daily. So he just wants to wrap it up and, and be done with it already. Ah, I see. All right. So in hearings, the other side gets to say things. In depositions... He just gets to press uh, selectively, and then, leak yeah, leak it out. Okay, maybe that's it. Maybe that's why he doesn't want to continue with hearings. There, they they involve the other side. They did not go the way he wanted. Anyway, right. that's it for me. We're just okay. about at the hour. I don't know where your mute buttons are or whether your your music's coming. It is. Who can tell? Uh, I don't know. There it is. If you can't tell now, then we have a, a technical issue. But now, okay, you can you can hear it. All right, so that's good. We're all in the same place. All right, well, thank you, Greg. Today, only Wednesday. This means you get another shot at it tomorrow. I'll bet the news will be largely the same, but they'll uh, probably have been an angry truth social something or other from Trump and maybe some gagging going on. Yeah, I'll come tomorrow, but I won't be wearing my lawsuit. Okay. (laughs) All right, thanks very much. We'll see you tomorrow. All right, welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Time to turn... Oh, you know what? I haven't checked in on the social media inputs, although uh, they've quieted down quite a bit uh, in the last couple of weeks, and so I don't think I'm missing anything. And, and I think I'm able to say at this point that... Um, just take one more look at the KITM hashtag on Twitter, which I still retain in case anybody wants to use it and communicate with me there, but that is slowing down to a trickle. And all of the other people who occasionally used uh, at much lower volume the KITM hashtag, not because it was the KGR in the morning hashtag, but because, like in this case, what's KITM? Oh, I don't know. It's in a foreign language. East Africa Radio was making use of KITM somehow. And for a while, there was another podcast, right? Was it called Kids in the Middle or something like that? I don't know what that was supposed to be about. But uh, everybody making the migration to other uh, other platforms. I think it's about time I can, at a minimum, I can stop checking Twitter entirely. Uh, in, in terms of uh, contemporaneous input. So that's kind of good news for all of us in general. Uh, maybe it'll be our loss when he turns it into a super successful dating site next year. I understand that uh, is somehow in his plans, although it, it will also be a mobile bank of some kind. So not entirely clear that he's got a real vision for uh, a positive vision for Twitter. The negative vision is becoming clear. But uh, anyway, very interesting. D- 
dating site very much needed in uh, America and the world. He's saving civilization. Uh, he's a visionary. You know, it used to be that, uh, again, Elon Musk was like, uh, we're going to colonize Mars and we're going to have self-driving cars and we're going to have hyperloops under all of America's cities and eliminate traffic. And we're going to get dates next year. That's going to happen. We're all going to find uh, find happiness in uh, the incel, uh, ending the incel plague, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, uh, that not as lofty a goal, I find, as colonizing Mars. Although, I mean, it wasn't a, it, it's lofty sounding. I don't know if it's a great idea, but dating app, like, no, I don't understand. There's actually plenty already, and I, and they're not all that popular necessarily, or they're not great successes for the most part. There are a few of them that are kind of hanging on, uh, but I don't know. Anyway, that just, out there for the future of Twitter, I guess. And then we can definitely stop paying attention to it. So good news and good on you for all migrating over to other platforms. And uh, let's see. Oh, I have to check and see. I had one more request for a Blue Sky uh, code that I wasn't able to fulfill, but I should take... Yeah, see, I'm still out. It's going to be a couple more days until... I get another one in. But if anybody has got one to spare, I guess, and who's listening today, uh, uh, send me a note and I'll try and connect you with the one pending request that I haven't been able to fulfill. And if nobody's got any in about three or four days time, I'll be able to turn around and and hand one more out uh, and then I'll have caught up with my list. Oh, and speaking of lists that I need to catch up with, how about this? Uh, I was poking around in my uh, voluminous undealt with emails and found that there may have been uh, a couple of uh, contributions, regular contributions signed up for by others who didn't come in through Patreon. And, you know, I like to eventually, hopefully get around to thanking everybody who joins us in support of the show. And Patreon makes it easy in that they're, Notification emails stand out, and I can see that. But PayPal notifications uh, are mixed. Uh, in other words, PayPal here, – here's the, the technical explanation for PayPal – notifies me every time a, a payment is received. But for the most part and for the longest time, PayPal notifications were longstanding, uh, repeating donations from people who had already been welcomed into the fold – and which continued over time. And uh, visually, in a quick scan of your email, they're indistinguishable, unless you're really looking closely, uh, from notices that new people have signed up for new repeating uh, contributions. And so I think I skipped over a bunch of them. And uh, over the summer, it looks like there were two new-ish ones from Morris Smith going back to June, June 30th, and Later on in July, uh, right around mid-month, July 11th, Jeffrey Houlihan, uh, who joined up via PayPal and not Patreon. Perfectly fine. Everything works. It's totally welcome and we absolutely appreciate it. But yeah, through um, no fault of yours, uh, the notification system is not quite as uh, clear as the Patreon notification system. Eh. And if that's of interest to you and you don't mind signing up for Patreon, then then that's the route to go. But uh, for a lot of people, PayPal is still the one and only uh, for them trusted, uh, or, or maybe they don't trust it, but they're, they figure my my data is already in their hands. Uh, I trusted them once, maybe it wasn't a great idea, but now I'm stuck with them and so I'd like to use PayPal. And going even further back, that prompted me to then say, all right, well, what's the what's the text that uh, PayPal uses in these email notifications. I should enter that and do a search for that and see if there are any that I may have missed. And it's hard to tell because sometimes my records going back to March are, uh, well, they're spotty. All my records are spotty. It's like, uh, you know, index cards where I write down a note to myself. Remember to thank, in this case, Richard Murphy. This goes all the way back to March. March 31st, it's as late as you can get in March, uh, but there it is. March 31st, 
Also, Richard Murphy signing up as a sponsor via PayPal. And maybe these three never got their due. So I apologize for that. Uh, and uh, I'll try and keep a sharper eye out for PayPal or make a regular sweep through the email. Now, it may be that many of you have uh, found yourself in the same boat, and it's very difficult for me to tell whether or not I uh, gave you your due. But if not, uh, well, I don't know. If you want, you can send an email or some other note and say, you know, no big deal or anything. I'm happy to support you. But I never did get my, I was, I would thrill to hear my name called out. And uh, let's do it on the honor system. Uh, I can't be calling out everybody. Well, I can if you want to. If you really want to be called out a second or third time because you really enjoy it, you can go ahead and do that too. Like everybody who shows up at the house <clears throat> last night got candy, even though we did in fact have the uh, uh, no costume and carrying a garbage bag brigade showing up at some night. I, if you care enough to come up my townhouse steps, uh, you can at least get a couple of bite-sized pieces of of old man candy. That's my gift to you. Besides which, I had too much as it was. So anyway, there you go. So I think good housekeeping requires, not the magazine, but the practice requires thanks to Morris Smith, Jeffrey Hulan, and Richard Murphy, who maybe have been waiting ages to be called out and thanked for their contributions. All right. Other things that I wanted to share with you, and there are many, uh, they're stowed away in pocket. Uh, let's see. So there were two New York Times articles of some interest, both rather long at that. And um, I thought perhaps uh, we might want to look into them. One was the one that Greg mentioned, the New York Times piece, Trump's allies want a new style of lawyer if he returns to power. And we should read into that because there's some discussion of what they're up to with respect to the Federalist Society, but also, you know, well, uh, some reactions on uh, social media to that piece along the lines of, well, duh, everybody knows that. Or why won't you say that's fascism as opposed to simply just saying, gosh, he wants a new style of lawyer because the style of lawyer that he wants is, is not a lawyer. I mean, that's really the intent of sharing this entire piece is to be able to make those comments along the way. But on the other and I have got Tom Edsel's piece, and they're all long because it's Tom Edsel. Uh, Christian nationalism is no longer operating beneath the surface. That is, that it has crested the waves and is now out in the open. And that, too, draw lots of hoots and hollers. Oh, they've been doing that since the 1980s. How could you not have noticed? Yeah, but it does seem he's got a point in that it seems different in kind or newly emboldened in a way that uh, uh, of, uh, you know, the quiet part spoken out loud kind of thing. I mean, that's happening across the board with what Trump is up to. But uh, I don't know. It's not a bad thing to call it out. Uh, he may get mocked a little bit, too, but uh, it's worth doing. All right. So let me see. Why don't we read that uh, New York Times piece? Because that seems kind of central to to discussions we've had over the years uh, on this show, what's the title? Trump's allies want a new style of lawyer. And here, I guess you should put lawyer in scare quotes. If he returns to power. And maybe even put that in scare quotes, quote unquote, returns to power. Politically appointed lawyers sometimes frustrated Donald J. Trump's ambitions. And that's an interesting thing to uh, we're going to have a lot of commentary on this article. This is only the subheader. Politically appointed lawyers. Well, how did they get politically appointed? He appointed them. I mean, it's not, this is interesting. Like there's no, uh, maybe they discuss this in the body of the article, but politically appointed lawyers sometimes frustrated Donald J. Trump's ambitions. His allies are planning to install more legal gatekeepers, more aggressive legal gatekeepers if he regains the White House. Um, but, you know, note for the record, when you say install more aggressive legal gatekeepers, what do you mean? He means politically appointing them. And it should probably be noted for the record that if they were politically appointed by Trump, even though they may have disappointed him last time, doesn't that mean that they're not the deep state, right? Deep state lawyers who were always frustrating his purpose are people that he did not appoint that were held over from previous administrations, not uh, specifically because actually, because they were not political appointees, they were professional civil servants. But anywho, 
Um, mm, whatever. Uh, now, pictured in the photo accompanying the piece are uh, Donald Trump, of course, and there's Steve Mnuchin. We all recognize him. And um, Russell Vogt is prominent in this. He's apparently the kind of legal gatekeeper that they have in mind here. How do we know this? They asked Russell Vogt. He's quoted extensively in the article and he is pictured here uh, in the center. I don't know who he's uh, alongside besides Mnuchin here. Anyway, who's reporting? Jonathan Swan, Charlie Savage, Maggie Haberman. Usual suspects, but in a, you know, in combination. Close allies of Donald J. Trump are preparing to populate a new administration with a more aggressive breed of right-wing lawyer, dispensing with traditional conservatives who they believe stymied his agenda in the first term. Not just the deep state doing it, but traditional conservatives. And they are making that point specifically. The allies have been drawing up lists of lawyers they view as ideologically and temperamentally suited to serve in a second Trump administration. Now, they are ideologically and temperamentally not suited to serve as lawyers or on the bench, but they are suited for a second Trump administration. Their aim is to reduce the chances that politically appointed lawyers would frustrate a more radical White House agenda, as they sometimes did when Mr. Trump was in office, by raising objections to his desires for certain harsher immigration policies or for greater personal control over the Justice Department, among others. Now, as Trump allies grow more confident in an election victory next fall, boo, several outside groups staffed by former Trump officials who are expected to serve in senior roles if he wins, he won't throw me under the bus, he'll put me right back in government have begun parallel personal uh, personnel rather efforts, though they are probably also personally driven as well. At the start of Mr. Trump's term, his administration relied on the Influential Federalist Society, the conservative legal network whose members filled key executive branch legal roles and whose leader helped select his judicial nominations. But in a striking shift, and, and I hope uh, a shift towards striking them, Trump allies are building new recruiting pipelines separate from the Federalist Society. And yet here, all that money had been put into that pipeline. I wonder if they'll waste it. These backroom discussions were described by seven people with knowledge of the planning, most of whom spoke on condition of anonymity to describe private conversations. In addition, the New York Times interviewed senior, former senior lawyers in the Trump administration and other allies who have remained close to the president, not yet under the bus, and are likely to serve in a second term because they're not yet under the bus. The interviews reveal a significant break within the conservative movement. The top Trump, uh, top Trump allies have come to view their party's legal elites, even leaders with seemingly impeccable conservative credentials, as out of step with their movement. Hmm. What even is their movement? The Federalist Society doesn't know what time it is, said Russell T. Vogt, a former senior Trump administration official who runs a think tank with close ties to the former president. You can't have very close ties if you're thinking, though, so that's not really possible. He argued that many elite conservative lawyers had proved to be too timid when, in his view, and he's Russell T. Vogt, goddammit, the survival of the nation is at stake. Such comments may surprise those who view the Federalist Society as hardline conservatives. They are. They are. But the move away from their group reflects the continuing evolution, which they don't even believe in, of the Republican Party in the Trump era and an effort among those now in his inner circle to prepare to take control of the government in a way unseen in modern presidential history. Uh, and it should be noted part of what is about it that's unseen in modern presidential history is the lack of control in it by the president and the lack of interest in taking control by the president. That's that's kind of unseen in modern presidential history as well, as well as the departure from any interest in the rule of law. Two of the allies leading the push are, to probably no one's surprise, non-lawyers, Stephen Miller, Trump's former senior advisor and John McEntee, another trusted aide whom the then president had empowered in 2020 to rid his administration of political appointees perceived as disloyal or obstructive. How did he do on that job? Well, 
Trump is running for president again on the premise that he never really got to do what he wanted to do because there were too many political appointees who sucked and couldn't be gotten rid of. Who couldn't get rid of them? John McEntee. Who's on tap to run this thing again? John McEntee. So you tell me what Trump learned in his first uh, uh, term of office. Nothing. What did uh, John McEntee and Stephen Miller learn? Uh, Poison everybody so that they're dead and the only people left for Trump to turn to is you, even though you were horribly ineffective at uh, achieving your goals the first time. Will you be any better at it the second time? Who cares? In four years, there won't be any more Trump terms to run in. And, uh, you know, as long as we're around poisoning our enemies, what do we care? But, you know, uh, MAGA, they love it, right? The nonprofit groups they are involved in, that is McEntee and Miller, are barred by law, and uh, really, shouldn't we get rid of that law, from supporting a candidate. And none of the work they are doing is explicitly tied to Mr. Trump. In other words... They're obeying the law that they say they want to sweep away. So what's the problem here? But Miller and Mr. McEntee remain close to the former president and are expected to have his ear in any second term. Okay. Uh, And they can feel free to cut that ear off and take it with them as a souvenir. Mr. Trump himself, focused for now on multiple criminal and civil cases against him, appears disengaged from these efforts. And were he president, he would appear equally disengaged from them. But he made clear throughout his term in office that he was infuriated by many of the lawyers who worked for him, ranting about how they were weak and stupid because they were practicing law. And that's really what bothers him. By the end of his term, lawyers he appointed early in his administration had angered the White House by raising legal concerns about various policy proposals. But Mr. Trump reserved his deepest rage for the White House and Justice Department legal officials who largely rejected his attempts to overturn, yes, overturn the 2020 election, according to people who spoke with him. Casting about for alternative lawyers who would tell him what he wanted to hear, Mr. Trump turned for that effort to a group of outside lawyers, many of whom have since been indicted in Georgia, and it should be pointed out, several of whom who have since pled, pleaded rather guilty to the charges brought against them in Georgia. People close to the former president say they are seeking out a different type of lawyer committed to his America first ideology. Uh, Who's saying that? Well, people who have America First in their think tank group names like, uh, well, I don't know what the names are, but Stephen Miller, I believe, runs an America First type named organization. I don't know whether Russell Vogt uh, does the same, but uh, at any rate, these are certainly uh, the ideology they have in mind. So people close to him say they're seeking out someone who will be committed to his America first ideology and willing to endure the personal and professional risks of association with Mr. Trump. You have to know that you will eventually be under the bus. Are you good with that? Then come on board. They want lawyers in federal agencies and in the White House who are willing to use theories that more establishment lawyers would reject to advance his cause. This is, of course, a euphemistic way of saying They want lawyers who are not afraid to argue things that either aren't in the Constitution or are upside down interpretations of the Constitution or have no basis whatsoever in the Constitution, but still say that they are based in the Constitution so that judges have a fig leaf when they adopt these proposed uh, theories and make them real by approving them. This new mindset matches Mr. Trump's declaration that he is waging a, quote, final battle against demonic, quote, enemies populating a, quote, deep state within the government that is bent on destroying America. But again, the deep state, uh, the very polar opposite of the political appointees that are brought into the administration at Mr. Trump's personal discretion. He's responsible for them. It's the opposite of a deep state that he's talking about. But, you know, if there's not going to be any rule of law, there's not going to be any rule of logic either. So there you have it. There were a few lawyers like that in Mr. Trump's administration, but they were largely outnumbered, outranked, and often blocked by more traditional legal conservatives. For those who went to work for Mr. Trump but grew disillusioned, the push to systematically install Trump loyalists who may see the law as malleable 
across the second Trump administration has been a cause for alarm. You're meant to be alarmed in all of this, in case you were wondering. John Mitnick was appointed by Trump as general counsel of the Homeland Security Department in 2018, but he was fired in 2019 as part of a broad purge of the agency's leaders, whom Trump had installed and are not the deep state, and was replaced by one of Mr. Miller's allies. Mr. Mitnick predicted that, quote, no qualified attorneys with integrity will have any desire to serve as political appointees in a second Trump term, and that instead it would be predominantly staffed by opportunists who will rubber stamp whatever Trump and his senior White House staff want to do. In many ways, the Federalist Society has become synonymous with the Republican establishment, although really, honestly, the Federalist Society has in many ways become synonymous with opportunists who will rubber stamp whatever Trump and his senior White House staff want to do. But on occasion, they have done something different and angered Trump as a result. And now they, too, are learning their lessons. We'll see whether they remain on the outs here. But in many ways, they've become synonymous with the Republican establishment and its members' most common interests, including pushing an originalist interpretation of the Constitution, not true, and federal statutes. Well, they can be distinct from the whims and grievances of Mr. Trump himself. Its membership dues are low, and politically ambitious Republican lawyers of various stripes routinely join it or attend its events. Many of the more aggressive lawyers the Trump allies are eyeing have their own links to it. Maybe what they need to do is raise membership dues to Mar-a-Lago levels and thereby separate the men from the boys, if you will, and uh, and then allow the men to predate on the boys later on afterwards. But first, a separation. It's the separate shower facilities, except if you're in the uh, Jim Jordan wing of things, I guess. Anyway, uh, never mind. Uh, after both the legal policy fights inside the Trump administration and the refusal by the groups, that is, Federalist Society's most respected luminaries, to join Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Is that right? The phrase Federalist Society became a slur for some on the Trump-aligned right, a shorthand for a kind of lawyerly weakness. Uh, interesting, because, of course, they're all excited about Mike Johnson, but it might just be because they understand Mike Johnson to be lying. But Mike Johnson actually sort of espouses... Uh, this sort of belief like he's fairly invested in insisting that the things he and you know and and he finds some belief in this even in greg dworkin that well he was sticking to the legal route the, of, of, of filing legal challenges in court to all of this stuff uh but when he needs, and it's true, that's kind of how he was handling things. But my suspicion is, and I guess we have to, unfortunately, if you want proof, you're going to have to wait and see when it's too late. But I, I, I suspect that Mike Johnson would say just about anything to hang on and that uh, it would be his contention, well, I'm doing this thing legally and only by filing lawsuits. Uh, but it's a bit of a bait and switch in that he was filing lawsuits that, you know, normal lawyers knew had no chance in hell, but he just thought, maybe I can take advantage of this, uh, the, the pre-wrong pipeline thing here and rely on Federalist Society judges to uh, recognize where their bread is buttered and just decide to uh, reverse years of precedent or logic entirely. And adopt my view of things, which would, and you know, but remember, he was, he still insists, I wasn't going to overturn the election. I was merely going to, oh, I don't know, uh, lead the courts to the opposite conclusion about the election, which is, of course, overturning the election. But all right. Well, at any rate, I suspect that if push were come to, were to come to shove, that even People like, I mean, I, I think that probably the Federalist Society would find that they're more populated by people like Mike Johnson who cling to uh, this veneer of respectability and traditional lawyerly approaches to things until push comes to shove. And then when push comes to shove, they just say, oh, well, 
Um, you know, to hell with it. We'll just be fascists. Um, and of course, you know, most people then conclude, oh, they were fascists all along. Eh, maybe, maybe not. But in the end, if they join up, not much difference. Anyway, hard right allies of Mr. Trump increasingly speak of typical federal society members as squishes. Remember them? Too worried about maintaining their standing in polite society and their employment prospects at big firms to advance their movement's most contentious tactics and goals. Maybe. Uh, although it's only been about a week since people had to, or forced to by circumstances, to stop writing articles in mainstream media outlets about uh, the struggles uh, to find a new speaker being the revenge of the squishes and that the squishes were triumphant and ascendant. It's interesting that they are so quickly being put back in their place, not only by the election of Mike Johnson as Speaker of the House, but uh, Donald Trump's quest to uh, win the presidency again by any means necessary, including not winning it, but declaring that he has won it and hoping that some of the people he wants to appoint will simply accept that he got more votes or more electoral votes even. Sup fam, it's your boy Darwin, a.k.a. Darwin underscore Darko, a.k.a. the most reasonable man in America, a.k.a. KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and and we need to talk about Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organizations strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept a life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagrox at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. Okay, there's the button I was looking for. Good morning. Hey, welcome back to the Kagro in the Morning Show. All right, let's see. Uh, we already have responses coming through both on the through the Patreon messaging system where Paul has said that uh, he's got some codes to share. And uh, let's see, over on uh, Blue Sky itself, uh, Linda Chapman likewise says she's got codes to spare. So uh, hang on to them for the moment. Uh, I had to use part of the break to try and find the message I had where, uh, and who was it that was asking for him. I've now identified the person in question and, uh, in an effort to make sure that nobody wastes any codes, I want, well, thank you to both of you and I will, uh, I will, uh, randomly select, maybe we'll do a coin toss as between the two people offering, uh, for the opportunity to the honor of uh, bestowing one of those codes on the requesting party. But I, it, it, some logistics that took me longer than two minutes to try to figure out. Uh, we'll take care of it after the show. Thank you, everybody, for stepping up. Uh, so I can, uh, yeah, I can call that out to uh, the many people who have offered codes in the past. And uh, it's a nice little thing. Good. We can uh, use our network and our reach to get people paired up with the codes quicker than once a week, you know, for me to have to wait for these things to come through. All right. So, uh, uh, you know who you are, you one person who contacted us days ago about getting a code. And if you're listening live, if you're listening on the podcast, you'll find out later, uh, we've got you taken care of. I think, I mean, you don't, uh, count your chickens until they've hatched, but, uh, for the most part, I assume this chicken is going to hatch. Everything's going to be fine. Let's, Go back to uh, the very lengthy article in the New York Times about Trump's plans, or rather the plans that other people are putting in place for the very lazy, stupid, and very likely drug-addled Donald Trump, uh, so that he can fill his administration with 
idiots who will do his bidding, but who think that they will never be thrown under the bus for doing it. Uh, and look, so far, Russell T. Vogt and Stephen Miller have not spent any time under any buses. Now, there's a lot of buses out there. And if you uh, let me know if you have blue sky codes to share or if you drive a bus and are willing to run over one of these people. Because metaphorically speaking, that's where they belong. Anyway, uh, where were we? All right. Uh, hard right allies say that uh, when they speak of the Federalist Society, they view them as squishes, too worried about maintaining their standing in polite society, which is why they, they joined the Federalist Society and their employment prospects at big law firms. This was supposed to be stepping stone to fabulous career for them. And so, yeah, it's very likely that they might be concerned about that. Though, you know, if you can promise them uh, instant riches, fame, and power in a fascist Trump administration, maybe they'll take that. Trump and his administration learned the hard way in their first term that Democrats are playing for keeps. <laughs> They're the tough guys in all of this. That's Mike Davis, a former congressional aide who helped shepherd judicial nominees during the Trump administration and has become a close ally of the 45th president. And in the Trump 47 administration, they need much stronger attorneys who do not care about elite opinion or law who will fight these cultural battles. Well, that explains things. Next up, next section, a fraught union. And of course, they're anti-union, so... You see what's going on here. When Mr. Trump wrested the 2016 Republican presidential nomination away from the party's old guard, it was unclear whether social conservatives would turn out in the general election to vote for a thrice-married New Yorker who had cultivated a playboy reputation and once described himself as very pro-choice. But Mr. Trump won their support by essentially striking a deal with legal conservatives. He agreed to fill Supreme Court vacancies from a list of prospects compiled by a small number of movement stalwarts. This group, helping to shape the judiciary, included, of course, Leonard Leo, arguably the most powerful figure in the conservative legal movement and a leader in the Federalist Society, and Don McGahn. Remember him? He sort of faded from view, but very much a focus of the, um, the Mueller report. But for some reason who skated and didn't end up under the bus, or at least briefly was under the bus. But anyway, that, of course, Trump's 2016 campaign general counsel and first White House counsel, with a seat already open after the death of Justice Antonin Scalia, the move worked. Uh, exit polls showed that court-focused voters helped secure Trump's narrow victory, along with the Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, Leo and McGahn, and later Patsy Baloney, White House's, uh, Trump's second White House counsel, created an assembly line for turning Federalist Society style lawyers into appeals court judges and Supreme Court justices. And that's a great way of putting it, turning them into like there's just a magical formula that you can say, well, we can take this lawless, crazy a-hole and put him in a robe. And now everybody has to listen to him. Before, he was just the lawyer who got all their cases dismissed. Now, he's a judge who can uh, approve all of his buddies' cases if they choose to bring the same ones again. But the union between Trump and the conservative legal establishment could be more fraught than it sometimes appeared. As his presidency wore on, Trump attacked and sidelined many of the lawyers around him. That included Mr. Leo. One episode described by a person familiar with the incident illustrates the larger chill in January of 2020. What could have been happening then? Oh, I'm sorry. January 2020, not 21. Hmm. A year earlier, Leo was having dinner at Pervilago, as it happens, when Trump strode up to his table. The president stunned Mr. Leo, publicly berating him and accusing him of recommending the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, who appointed a special counsel to investigate ties between the Russian government and the Trump campaign. Taken aback, Leo protested that he had actually suggested someone else for the position. Patsy Baloney, of all people, as it turns out. Trump walked away without apologizing. Not that he ever was going to. Even if you had said, I nominated Jesus, he would still walk away without apologizing. Nearly a year later, 
when Trump was trying to enlist legal assistance for his efforts to overturn the 2020 election loss, he reached out three times to Mr. Leo. Hmm. Ah, now if you wondered what he would do about that. But Mr. Leo declined to take or return Trump's calls. Huh. And since has only dealt with him through others. Well, that's just crime boss uh, stuff, if you ask me. A spokesman for Trump did not respond to repeated requests for comment. In a statement, Leo said, I have nothing to say regarding his current efforts, but I'm just grateful that President Trump transformed the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary in his first term. I got what I wanted. I'm out of here. Mr. Mitnick's experience underscores the style of lawyering that Trump allies saw as too cautious. His role as the top lawyer at the Department of Homeland Security put him in the path of increasingly aggressive policy proposals from a top White House advisor to Trump, Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller, who is not a lawyer, is known for his vehement opposition to immigration and law, for that matter. Mr. Mitnick and Mr. Miller are said to have clashed directly and indirectly over legal risks raised by regulatory and policy actions emanating from the White House, including separating migrant children from their parents and transporting migrants to so-called sanctuary cities. In 2019, the White House purged the leadership ranks of the Homeland Security Department, firing Mr. Mitnick. Trump ultimately installed as his replacement Chad, <laughs> if you can believe it, Chad Mizell, Mizelli, I don't know, M-I-Z-E-L-L-E, who had been out of law school just seven years, but was a close Miller ally, like numerous opposition, or rather, like numerous other positions, sorry, filled later in Trump's term, Mizell was appointed as an, what kind of attorney general, or general counsel, rather, an Yes, was appointed as an acting attorney, uh, sorry, general counsel, sidestepping a Senate vetting and confirmation process. Well, sorry, that's the rules. You can get sidestep stuff. Never mind advice and consent. That would most likely have closely scrutinized whether he was, oh, I don't know, qualified for the job, for instance, with Mr. Mizell acting as the department's top lawyer when the COVID-19 pandemic arose. The Trump administration seamlessly invoked emergency powers somehow to flatly refuse to consider the petition of any asylum seeker arriving at the southern border. Hmm. Suddenly they believed in COVID as a real thing. Next up, seeking America first lawyers. Mr. Miller has stayed close to Mr. Trump and is expected to play an even more important role in shaping policy if Mr. Trump returns to power, unless someone spits in his sushi, I suppose. While out of office... Miller has been running a foundation focused on suing the Biden administration. That's good focus. And recruiting a new generation of America first lawyers with some from attorney general and some, and solicitor general offices in where Texas and other Republican controlled states. America first Republicans are often opposed to both legal and illegal immigration protectionist, uh, I guess it's should illegal and legal immigration, I should reverse them and stress the legal they're opposed to that, too. Protectionists on trade in general and skeptical of international alliances and military intervention overseas, unless they like it. One first term Trump lawyer who would most likely serve in a second term is Mark Pauletta, who served as general counsel at the Office of Management and Budget and worked closely, therefore, with Mr. Vote, the agency's director. The OMB team saw itself as an island of facilitators within an, an executive branch they believed was too quick to tell Trump that his ideas were unachievable or illegal. Together, Mr. Vote and Mr. Paletta came up with the idea of having Trump declare a national emergency and invoke special powers to spend more taxpayer money on a border wall that Congress was willing, was, I guess, unwilling for which a border wall or how do they screw this up here? Have I read this incorrectly? Declare a national emergency, invoke special powers to spend more taxpayer money on a border wall than Congress. There's the word. Than Congress was willing to appropriate. Okay. Mr. Paletta also believed that Mr. Trump could have exerted greater personal control over the Justice Department, although Mr. Paletta said in an interview that he did not advocate using the presidency's command over federal law enforcement for partisan and personal score settling. Wink. Yes, he did. He and other advisors 
likely to follow Trump back into power, view White House authority to direct the Justice Department as proper under the so-called unitary executive theory. Remember that one? Oh, George W. Bush was nothing like Donald Trump. He just gave birth to these stupid theories or gave birth to the idea that everybody could and should be considered pre-wrong if you just had the right lawyers and the right judges. It holds, of course, this stupid theory does, that presidents can direct command directly command the entire federal bureaucracy and that pockets of independent decision-making authority are unconstitutional. I believe a president doesn't need to be so hands-off with the DOJ, Mr. Paletta said. Uh, that, of course, is something that he would change his mind about if he were, say, a holdover from the Trump administration embedded within the Justice Department and Joe Biden sought to fire him. That would be illegal and unconstitutional. But in the opposite direction, it's totally fine. Uh, so I believe a president doesn't need to be so hands off with the DOJ. It's not a independent agency and he's the head of the executive branch. A president has every right to direct DOJ to look at items that are his policy priorities and other matters of national importance. Of course, uh, the question is, would it be considered a policy priority to prosecute his political rivals? Well, Trump would consider it to be a policy priority. Uh, Pauletta appears to be maintaining that, well, I I'm for, it doesn't have to be so hands-off. I would have limits, though. I don't think you should use it for personal uh, or political gain. Um, but if you ask me to, I probably would, because I don't want to lose my job. So, uh, Trump is not known for pondering legal philosophy, they put it gently, but he has found common cause with lawyers who have a sweeping view of presidential power. Unless, of course, it sweeps them up in it, in which case that is they've then found their limits. In his 2024 campaign, Trump has promised to, quote, appoint a real special prosecutor to go after President Biden and his family shattering the post-Watergate norm of Justice Department independence. More than any legal policy statement on his campaign website, retribution may be the closest thing to a governing philosophy for Mr. Trump as he seeks a second term. Next up, legal creativity, quote unquote. Trump has rarely looked closely at a lawyer's area of specialty. Instead, he has often looked at whether a particular lawyer can help him gain something he wants. He spent much of his first term railing against the lawyers who worked for him and wondering aloud why none of them could live up to the memory, anyway, of his notoriously ruthless mentor, Roy Cohn, who represented Trump in his early business career in New York. Uh, when he sought to overturn the 2020 elections, Trump was unsatisfied with his government lawyers, including his second White House counsel, Cipollone, who largely rejected his efforts to subvert the results. Trump turned to a different set, you could say, of outside lawyers, including, of course, Rudy Colludi Giuliani, John Eastman, Kenneth Cheeseborough, Jenna Ellis, and Sidney Powell. Let's see. Uh, all indicted and uh, the last three having pleaded guilty already in Georgia, at least. All of whom have since been indicted in Georgia in a racketeering case that charged the former president and 18 of his allies with conspiring to overturn the election loss there in 2020. Powell, Cheeseboro, and Ellis have pleaded guilty. Trump was also infuriated that the justices he had put on the Supreme Court declined to repay his patronage by intervening in the 2020 election. As Trump criticized the court, Leo with the Federalist Society, is said to have told associates he was disappointed that the former president's rhetoric made his judicial appointment record look transactional. What? Oh, no. Boo-hoo. Aimed at advancing Trump's personal interests rather than a broader philosophical mission. Sure, that's what Leo says he wanted. Of course, if Leo was president, he would be okay with it being transactional. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it sullies his record, I guess. Uh, I had high-minded reasons for putting these people on the Supreme Court, and Trump cheapened it by making it look transactional. Uh, except it was transactional. You wanted to get what you wanted out of it, and you got it. So there, but but because you you wanted quote unquote policy, that's not transactional. Whereas what he wanted was, uh, well, okay, he could probably disguise it as policy too if he wanted to. But no, it's his personal pa. So you know. The line is ephemeral at best. 
Anyway, in the same way, or possibly just illusory. Anyway, in the same way, Trump had a falling out with his attorney general, Bill Barr, of course, who refused to falsely say that the Justice Department had evidence of widespread voter fraud. Because it didn't. After Barr resigned, his deputy and successor, Jeffrey Rosen, also refused to throw the department's weight behind Trump's claims. Trump then explored the idea of installing Jeffrey Clark, an official who was willing to raise concerns, if there were any, about purported election fraud as acting attorney general. Clark had, but then, you know, uh, who made the call not to install Clark as acting attorney general? Trump himself. You know, oh, no, the deep state happens to include him. Wow, that's so weird. I've always been baffled by that. And I know that the excuse is supposed to be that, uh, who else said, Rosen and, uh, oh, dang, I can't remember everybody's name, but the people who were uh, then acting attorneys general and deputy attorney general uh, still said, well, if you do this thing, we'll both resign and that'll make you look bad. And I'm baffled why Trump said, oh, I can't have that. I will look bad. I'm amazed that he came to that conclusion. I mean, under normal circumstances, yes, a president would see that and say, oh, yeah, that will reflect badly on me. I'm astonished that Trump didn't say, what do I see? So you'll resign and I'll look bad. I'm not resigning. You're resigning. Why does that make me look bad? And besides which, who cares how I look? I look bad to who? A bunch of reporters, normal people in America, the vast majority of American voters. I don't care. I'm president again. Doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm amazed that that actually worked. I mean, I don't know why it really would. Maybe it didn't, but it's a story and people are sticking to it. I got no idea. I mean, he didn't make <clears throat> he didn't make clark acting attorney general that worked i mean i i think i think so well you know how trump is with paperwork maybe he did name clark acting attorney general and nobody wrote it down and brought it to the right place and so they were willing to you know and, and trump was like well I'm, I'm apparently i've moved out of the white house i don't appear to be able to regain it I don't have very much interest in insisting that I really did name Clark acting attorney general, but nobody would write it down and bring it to Congress. That makes me look weak. So fine. I, you know, we don't know. Maybe he did do that. Maybe he did. Maybe he did appoint Sidney Powell as special prosecutor. And again, nobody would write it down and bring it anywhere. I don't know. I guess you got to entertain that possibility. Something to think about as we make our way through this article. Anyway, uh, Clark has, of course, also been indicted in the Georgia case, but remains in favor with Trump and has met with the former president at his private clubs over the summer at Trump's golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey. Clark attended a fundraiser for the people who have been imprisoned for rioting at the Capitol on January 6th. Clark will most likely be in contention for a senior Justice Department position in any second Trump administration, depending on the outcome of his legal travails, or maybe despite them, he has written a constitutional analysis titled The U.S. Justice Department is Not Independent, and that amounts to an intellectual blueprint for direct presidential control of federal law enforcement. He declined to comment. On a conservative podcast last year, Clark said that extraordinary times call for extraordinary, responsive, legal creativity. That is an interesting way of putting it. Uh, you know, you'll have to prove in the first instance that this is actually uh, extraordinary times. But most people are willing to believe that right off the bat. But it's sort of interesting. Well, if you're concerned about the level of extraordinary ness of the times, then that justifies fascism, I guess. So, uh, OK, uh, why not stick to that formula? It'll probably work for him. Interesting, to say the least. Worrisome. Uh, as well. Just wanted to put that out there. I mean, we all knew that it was sort of coming, but uh, there you have it. Let's see. Maybe we can save for later in the week the question of whether it's worth reading through Tom Edsel's piece about Christian nationalism no longer operating beneath the surface, but I think we all sort of get that sense. Uh, all right. Yesterday I mentioned when Joan was on, and I didn't... Uh, provide the link and I didn't provide it to her either actually as it turns out but I mentioned to you that there was something that uh, what's her name Kelly Johnson uh, Mike Johnson's wife is wrapped up in that is a little weird and a little 
off-putting and uh, is almost certainly the sort of thing that if someone else were doing it, uh, who was a rival to Mike Johnson from whatever position, whether inside the Republican ranks or certainly if it was a Democrat doing it, would be denounced as paganism and witchcraft, possibly spirit cooking as well, and would be pointed to as a disqualifying practice. Kelly Johnson, uh, as you know, has got a, or had um, until yesterday when uh, she decided to erase all evidence of it, um, was practicing as a counselor of sorts um under what qualifications none but that's neither here nor there you don't need a degree or a license to make up your own kind of counseling service uh she didn't make this one up she read it in a book went to a couple i'm sure i guess like some sort of uh, christian ted talk about this stuff and decided hey i can open up a counseling service on that too it's going to give me the opportunity to tell people who are gay that they're completely wrong and need to change because God. So why not? Now, if it has some weird practices attached to it, so much the better. And how do you disguise your weird pagan practices? Uh, well, for one thing, uh, you could come over to the progressive side where we would say, well, paganism, you know, nothing particularly weird about that. We're open to that. But no, she's too conservative for that. And she doesn't want our uh, uh, green light to go ahead and practice that. So instead what you do is you say, well, it's, it's not pagan. It's Christian. It's ancient Christian. It's an ancient Christian belief. It's so ancient that everybody has forgotten that it's Christian. It's not Christian. It predates Christianity, uh, by a long shot. Um, but whatever, uh, they're just going to call it that it's ancient Christian. It's cover for, for what's going on. And, uh, if you say it's Christian, and you, you know, you're well known to be a Christian fundamentalist. Lots of other Christian fundamentalists will say, oh, it's Christian and say it's okay. So that's the way out for you, by the way. Drag performers worried about, uh, getting in trouble for your drag queen story hour at the public library this weekend. Uh, you just have to take a different tack. It's not a drag queen story hour. It's an ancient Christian story hour. See, in ancient Christianity, uh, well, you know, uh, sometimes men dressed up as uh, over-the-top, heavily made-up women, right? I don't know. Who cares? I mean, maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe there's not. doesn't matter. The point is it's now an ancient Christian practice and therefore beyond question. So what's the story? Quickly, in the few minutes we have left, Kelly Johnson, who is married to House Speaker Mike Johnson, this is all in the headline, practices a form of Christian counseling that classifies people into choleric, I don't remember how the actual pronunciations go, choleric, choleric, phlegmatic, and other ancient personality types purportedly ordained by God. This reported, I believe, by Brent Griffiths for Business Insider. I'm going to check on that because, you know, there's a paywall. But yes, it looks like that's the case. But I got to read you the pocket version of this. Kelly Johnson, the wife of the newly elected House Speaker, ran a Christian counseling service that is affiliated with an organization that advocates against abortion and homosexuality and who practices whose practices are built on the teachings of the Greek physician Hippocrates. All right. Well, he's pretty well respected, right? So it can't be that bad, except he wasn't a Christian. He's pre-Christian. Does that make it pagan? I don't know. Uh, actual pagans will maybe, uh, argue. Well, that doesn't, just because it's pre-Christian monotheistic or polytheistic, uh, and associated with ancient Greece doesn't, I mean, I don't know. Do they call ancient Greek polytheism paganism as like a big broad umbrella, everything that's not Abrahamic in it and monotheistic in its approach? Pagan or is pagan specifically Western European? and nature-based, et cetera. I don't know. I don't want to offend the pagans, honestly, you know, on this. But okay, at any rate, so maybe pagan is the wrong terminology and plays into the weird Christian viewpoint that everything that isn't Christian is pagan. But okay, it's not clear if Kelly Johnson will continue her practice. It is now. She's scrubbing her website. Uh, but she may just do it in secret and call it something else. So they may be right there. Not long after Representative Mike Johnson became House Speaker last week, Kelly Johnson's website became inaccessible. Johnson, her husband of more than 24 years, 
rose overnight from a virtually obscure, virtually obscure, pretty obscure House lawmaker to the position that is second in line to the presidency. The couple is deeply religious. Both Kelly and Mike Johnson previously worked with religious organizations and causes the religious right advocates for. Along with her counseling, Johnson is also listed as an advisor to the Louisiana Right for Life organization. You know what they're about. Kelly Johnson's website listed a specialty in temperament counseling, a specialty that she received training for, maybe, sort of, kind of, from an organization founded in the 1980s by a Christian couple. So, you know, ancient Christianity, 1980. According to the materials the organization provides, the National Christian Counselors Association is adamant that its offerings take place outside of more traditional state-licensed settings so that counselors and clients can be fully engaged through their faith and not, you know, regulation and uh, people's rights to be treated by people who know what they're doing. The state licensed professional counselor in certain states is forbidden to pray, read, or refer to the Holy Scriptures, counsel against things such as homosexuality, abortion, etc. A catalog of the organization's offering states initiating such counsel could be considered unethical by the state. So it's interesting. They fight against that, but then they also at the same time lobby very hard for, well, why the state should maybe allow them to go ahead and do this. So belt and suspenders. Anyway, the temperament-based approach breaks people down into five types. Why five? The answer is because Hippocrates used four. And this new guy from the 1980s, I guess, needed to put his own stamp on it, make security moms out of the uh, temperament council and just added out of nowhere a fifth type now melancholy choleric sanguine and phlegmatic were the four that hippocrates recognized they have added i guess uh, am i right about this one supine i don't even know what that is and what humor it's supposed to be regulated to anyway richard and phyllis arno who established a test to identify people's temperament founded the national christian counselors association in the early 1980s they and their advocates prefer the term temperament over personalities as the term personality is characterized as a mask where temperaments are inborn and thus inherent like planted there by god although possibly by polytheistic gods such as hippocrates networksradio.com okay You've been listening to kegro in the morning Waldman. All right. Well, there's much more to this, and maybe we'll return to a reading about it. I just wanted to like let you know what I was talking about generally. You can read about this if you like. We may have to return to this because there's some real weirdos associated with this, if you can believe it. But uh, stay tuned instead for our favorite weirdo from our side, Justice Putnam, coming up next.